Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, to a second AI Journal Club. So the last time, people could not see my screen. So I'm just going to have Dan so that you can see my screen. And uh, my name is Judy Kichoy. I'm a resident at Indiana University. And um, we're going to discuss the Chexnet paper today with a 30 minute talk format. Okay, it's good to go. So uh, with a paper summary uh, from 10 minutes from the authors and Luke is gonna go through the data stuff and Jeremy will talk more on methodology and deep learning. So during each presentation, since we have a big panel, they're going to talk a little bit about themselves, what they do and what they care about in deep learning. And then as usual, we'll have a discussion for 30 minutes. Since we have 300 registered attendees, the way we do this is just write your question on the question box in the GoToWebinar, and I'm going to ask the question on your behalf. So since the last, the first journal club, we've formed uh, an advisory council, and these are the memberships. Lindsay is one of the IU residents in R2. Patricia is from Emory in R2. Kevin, like me, is going into IR. He's from UCLA. Shaheen is from Harvard and Dan from Virginia. And he's also the vice chair for the resident and fellow section for the ACR. So thank you everyone for your help. And so a little bit of housekeeping. Our next speaker, today's session is gonna be great, but our next speaker is the first female guest we are having on this. A general club it's the general club is going to be on the 22nd february and this is timnit gabriel who has done amazing work by just analyzing google street view images to determine the social demographic um, survey for u.s households and you know people are starting to analyze such data to see how you vote and that has such a big impact on you know like fairness and accountability around ai so please mark this date and join us and so the reason why we're all here is this chexnet paper and in this paper generated a lot of media reviews you know some miss well misworded but we're gonna decide on that today from our excellent panelists and this the title of this paper is radiologist level pneumonia de detection on chest x-rays with deep learning and we have a good representation of the author team. Actually, everyone who's marked in red is on this call. And so that's pretty good pre presentation. Pranav will be presenting on this. And then we'll have um, Luke and Paras talk a little bit about the data and Jeremy feed in more on the methodology. And we have extra panelists to answer questions. A little bit of uh, some something we tried out this time was this radai.club. I encourage you to check it out. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time right now on it. And we just uh, re, re did the chest x-rays that were included in this data set as tests and are allowing you to just decide whether you decide whether this is pneumonia or not. And we've had interesting feedback, you know, like for example, including a confidence interval to determine your level of confidence that this is pneumonia and we can improve on that as we go along. But we just wanted to give you a real life view of how these machines perform and um, the sort of the data set that they're looking at. And we've had very good participation. Actually, we have 400 test radiographs read from yesterday. So just a shout out, tomorrow at noon, there'll be a JSCR Twitch chat around data science, still continuing the talk about AI and radiology. Will we be replaced? you know, how can data science and AI impact medicine and how can you learn about data science? So please join in the JSCR to chat and all you need to do is use their hashtag to follow at noon EST. So this is my contact. I put it uh, at the beginning of the session because I think last time people kept pinging me what was a good way to keep in touch. We have a lot of uh, Twitter people today retweeting all our discussion and this is my hashtag and my email. So I'm going to hand over to Pranav to summarize the paper, and then we'll get started this with this general club. And thanks for coming. Great, uh, thanks Judy. And uh, thanks for inviting us to uh, have this discussion. Be able to share my screen in a second. Um, so I'm gonna attempt to give a very short uh, overview of the work. Um, 
I'm joined in the room by uh, my colleague Jeremy Irvin and uh, team members Katie, Robin, Matt, and we also have Kurt. And uh, we'll expect to hear from them over the discussion. So I'll start off by just motivating uh, the detection of pneumonia. Important problem to work on, uh, and chest radiographs are the best available method for, for diagnosing pneumonia. And one of the challenges with detecting pneumonia automatically is that the appearance of uh, the pathology uh, in x-rays uh, in, in radiographs is vague and can mimic other abnormalities uh, such as cancer if uh, the cells are, if the uh, alveoli are filling up with cells and um, if they're filling up with blood, it's uh, something else. In this work, we show two things. One is that we're able to detect pneumonia um, at the level of radiologists from chest radiographs. And the second contribution is state-of-the-art results on all 14 pathologies uh, that have been covered in the chest X-ray 14 data set, which is the largest public X-ray data set. I'll dive right into the setup. So we have an input image, which is a chest radiograph, and this is going to go into a model that's going to output the probability of that image showing evidence of pneumonia. The model is a 2D convolutional neural network, which runs over 224 by 224 images. We use models that are pre-trained on ImageNet. Uh, which is a large repo consisting of hundreds of millions of images um, that have been used to train uh, models that can detect a variety of objects. And we can use pre-trained models to develop models for pure medical imaging. The specific architecture that we use is called DenseNet architecture. Just to briefly go over what the DenseNet architecture is, is it's a, um, it's a convolutional neural network where the, where the main idea is that you connect every layer to every other layer. Usually you would only connect one layer to the layer after it, uh, not every layer to every other layer. So that's the core idea of a DenseNet. And why this works is once we have every layer connected to every other layer, the error signal has a shortcut to go through the earlier layers in the network and doesn't have to pass through a lot of layers and get diluted over time. So this is improved information flow that, that we see with, with dense nets. And also we can reduce the number of parameters that we need to have uh, to have that network uh, go from the input to the output. So that's the network. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the data set and I'll only briefly touch upon, upon this. So the data set that we're using is the CHESS X-ray 14 data set released by the NIH, 100,000 plus examples released September of 2017. Each of the radiographs is annotated with up to 14 different pathologies. Um, a critical point is these are annotated using natural language processing methods on, on the radiology reports. We have a test set, uh, which is 420 of these chest radiographs, which we have four Stanford radiologists in, independently annotate. Uh, one point I do want to highlight, uh, which was this point was raised. Um, earlier that we didn't mention in the paper is that we use stratified random sampling such that there are at least 50 positive examples of each of the 14 pathologies in these 420 chest x-rays. Having lots of data and a deep network is a recipe for success in deep learning and we've seen that in a lot of different fields for visual object recognition, for speech recognition, and more recently in medical image diagnosis. We evaluate our model on both 
precision recall, which we can represent in one metric, the F1 metric. Uh, machine learning folks um, commonly use the F1 metric as a way to track the performance of models and compare model performance in one simple metric that captures both the precision and the recall. Specifically, to evaluate, let's say, a radiologist, we have the radi one radiologist as the prediction, and we have another radiologist as the ground truth, and we're going to get one F1 score from there. We repeat the process, get it again, and we get it against four ground truths. Symmetric evaluation method for the model itself, where it's compared to each of the four ground truths and the F1s averaged over all of them. What we find is that compared with the average radiologist, ChexNet has a high, higher F1 score. I'll also bring your attention to ChexNet versus each of the individual radiologists, and we see that it's able to get a higher F1 score than three out of the four radiologists. We then do a bootstrap uh, around the difference in F1 scores and find that compared with the radiologist average, ChexNet's performance is statistically significantly better. There are, of course, a few limitations of this study. Chest X-ray 14 has only frontal radiographs. Um, and this has been shown to have um, lower agreement rates, or lower radiologist performance than if both the frontal and the lateral views were uh, presented. But this is something that affects the model as well. And the second is, of course, no access to patient history or prior examination, which is very useful in, uh, for example, determining that something is probably pneumonia. I said that the second contribution was that we're able to outperform previous state of the art. And here were two previous results on chest x-ray 14, the first by the authors of the uh, paper that introduced the data set, and the second, which was a uh, work done by another independent group. On all 14 pathologies, we have better area under the ROC curve. We went a step further in our algorithm to try to determine how we would have radiologists trust the model and also to help us understand how to debug the model and whether it's learning how to identify pneumonia or just an artifact of the data set. Specifically, we try to look at what parts of the image are most important for making that diagnosis. We use class activation maps for this, which is a procedure used for visual recognition to understand, for example, where a dog is in an image if a model is saying there is a dog in the image. Similarly, when we use it for pneumonia, here's an example where we can see that the model is highlighting in red parts of the image that it thinks is most characteristic of pneumonia. Here is an example of another pathology in the data set, pneumothorax. And here is an example of nodules. One of the benefits of having such a tool is that it's clear how it can be integrated into the radiology workflow, helping radiologists pay attention to something that they might have missed. On the other side, there's also that this model can be verified by radiologists to see that it's doing something that's, um, that's actually what the radiologists themselves would do, or to see that, okay, this model is probably looking in the wrong place and needs further, um, further work to improve on. So we show that we're able to do pneumonia detection from chest x-rays using uh, the latest and greatest deep learning techniques. But the real goal that we're working towards is improving healthcare delivery. Earlier, I explained how one of the 
applications that we're looking towards is how we can help radiologists prioritize their workflows and make better diagnosis, increase decreasing the false negative and the false positive rates of radiologists. But the second point that that motivates our work is that two thirds of the global population lacks access to skilled radiologists. And it's here that I think that such work can have most impact, where if we can increase access to medical imaging expertise globally, where a lot of the world has access to machines, but not to skilled interpreters, then we think that's where we can have a lot of impact. And, and that's a goal that we're keeping in mind as, as we're producing works like these. Uh, so I'll stop there and, uh, uh, and we'll, we'll looking forward to, to the discussion. Um, you can find a little more information about, about the, the work that we've done with, with ChexNet um, on our website. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Judy. Sorry. Yeah, I think uh, you're yeah. So, uh, Catherine, we can go ahead and have Luke make the presentation so that we can um, discuss the paper. I see some questions already coming in through the chat. I'm noting them down, but we want to hear everyone who's scheduled to speak. Luke? Yeah, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, I'm Luke. I'm a radiologist and a deep learning researcher from South Australia. So. Uh, the middle bottom part of Australia, if, if you're not sure where South Australia is. Um, and I'm uh, interested in the intersection between medicine and artificial intelligence. Um, I, when I'm not doing clinical work or uh, research, I uh, write a blog about these sort of issues. And I spent a pretty significant amount of time exploring the data set that TextNet is built on. So I've just been asked to uh, explore the data set a bit more for you today. So uh, to start with, like uh, Pranav just said, uh, the data set is the largest uh, X-ray data set in the world, the largest radiology data set that's publicly available. That's uh, about 110,000 chest X-rays. Um, it's only got about 30,000 patients in it. So uh, one of the important things to bear in mind to start with is that a lot of patients have multiple studies. And actually, there's quite a lot of patients with only a single study. So a lot of patients have quite a large number of studies. Uh, these are typically uh, ICU patients, int intensive care patients who get scanned daily and their studies change very little. It's an important structural element to this data set. Um, and again, as Pranav said, there are 14 different labels that this data is given uh, that essentially you can think of them as sort of descriptions or diseases. Um, and they range from descriptive things like an enlarged heart uh, to purely sort of diagnostic terms, things like a pneumothorax, where there's really only one thing that can uh, cause that imaging appearance. Um, a lot of these labels, though, are somewhere in between. So we don't know if they're diagnostic. We don't know if they're descriptive. Uh, they're somewhere in the middle, and it's a bit hard to work out exactly where they sit and what they mean. So a couple of months ago, uh, you know, the data set got released, and I was very interested in getting my hands on it. It's, you know, this big data set could potentially use it in my own research. And so I started having a look through it. And the first thing I did was I started looking at the images. And it became apparent very quickly uh, that uh, there was a problem that the images didn't seem to match the labels very well. And uh, so I essentially saw that, um, you know, the labels describe one thing, the images often don't have a visual appearance of that. It doesn't mean the patient didn't have that thing. So if the label says a pneumothorax, it doesn't mean they didn't have one. It just means I couldn't see it on the picture. Um, now, there's the, as Pranav said, the, the data set was created by text mining. So instead of looking at the images and getting a human uh, to decide what's on them, they took the original radiology reports and they tried to uh, 
extract sort of keywords from those reports that mean one of these uh, specific diseases or descriptions. Now, the problem here is that this can go wrong in two ways. The first way is fairly easy to work out. It's that uh, the text mining process itself isn't very good. And the team that created the data set tested that. They, they found that their text mining process was about 90% accurate. And so, you know, that's not, not fantastic, but it, it's good enough to be building these models on. Um, the problem is the second way that this process can fall apart is if the reports don't reflect the images. You know, we're trying to do an image analysis task, so what's on the images is what the model's trying to learn. And if the reports and the images don't match up, we have a problem. Um, it, it may be a bit strange to think of, uh, you know, for the radiologists or even the, the other people that are listening in, but it's quite often that reports don't reflect images. And there's a number of reasons why, but the, the key concept here is that the report, its primary purpose isn't to describe the image. The primary purpose is to communicate something to a clinician. And because there's that different purpose, they can have this mismatch. And so a few examples that I could give, um, the classic one would be in these ICU films, that often these reports uh, will just say, there's no change compared to yesterday. And that's a really, really useful clinical thing to tell people, but it's, has absolutely no information about what's on the study. The person could have, you know, a collapsed lung, they could have uh, a fluid all, all through their lungs or a big infection, um, and the report doesn't say it. So if we're just mining the report from the text, uh, that those labels are going to be missing. Um, you know, other ex examples would, uh, you know, more day-to-day -day practice would be things like, say, a hiatus hernia, which is sort of the stomach sitting up behind the heart instead of below in the abdomen where it should be. Uh, we just often don't report it because it's not clinically relevant and it takes up space and clinicians don't like reading long reports. So uh, the labels don't necessarily reflect what we're seeing on the images. So when I started seeing this problem, I decided, you know, I'll have to investigate this more seriously. I went through several hundred examples of each, uh, of each label and went through all the images. And overall, it turns out the labels are probably about 50% accurate. So the labels reflect the images in about 50% of cases. Uh, in the case of Chexnet, where we're talking about pneumonia uh, for one of the experiments, uh, pneumonia is probably slightly worse. It's probably more 30 to 40% uh, accurate uh, in the sense that around 50 to 60% of these uh, images uh, don't have features that I would consider related to pneumonia. Um, there's a further issue with this data set as well that uh, it's not very clear what these labels mean. And uh, there's a couple of reasons for this. First of all, um, in particular, looking at the pneumonia label, uh, what radiological pneumonia is and what clinical pneumonia is are different things. And then what we describe as radiological pneumonia um, can overlap with other conditions. So Pranav did mention this uh, at the start of his uh, talk that uh, there's a lot of mimics for pneumonia. Things that look like pneumonia can be other, other pathologies. And the problem with this label set is that there's four labels that are essentially descriptions of a very similar process. So we have pneumonia labels, uh, which is the lung infection. Uh, we have consolidation, which is uh, the lung when it's filled with something like pus or blood or, or cells. And so pneumonia is just a subset of consolidation a lot of the time. Uh, infiltration is another label in this data set, uh, which, you know, again, is a superset that contains pneumonia. Uh, you know, there's, uh, pneumonia is a subset of infiltrates. And atelectasis, uh, which means sort of a, an area of lung without air in it, um, is often uh, visually indistinguishable from pneumonia as well. So we have these four distinct labels that, um, you know, the, the data set seems to suggest mean different things, but visually, uh, with images, they don't. They, they often look completely identical. And in fact, in this data set, um, there's very little overlap that, uh, you know, under 5% of the time does pneumonia co-occur with uh, something like consolidation, even though we almost use the terms synonymously, interchangeably, when we report studies. So that's the second issue with these labels. The third issue uh, is that it's not clear that the labels are medically important. 
Uh, the classic example that I gave in the blog post I wrote is when we're talking about the pneumothorax label. Um, the vast majority of patients labeled with a pneumothorax have a chest drain in. So the chest drain is the way you treat a pneumothorax. The collapsed lung uh, has a drain put in and the air gets sucked out and so the, the lung can really expand. Um, the problem is that at that point, we don't need to detect the pneumothorax anymore. We know one's there. Um, we don't really care uh, that uh, it's present or not anymore, except that we care if it's getting smaller or bigger, which these labels don't tell us. Um, but the other probably more important thing is that uh, these deep learning systems will learn whatever you give them. And if the vast majority of uh, labels have a, have a chest drain in place, then uh, the system is very likely to learn that chest drains mean pneumothorax, and that's not true. Um, and in fact, if only a small number of cases don't have a chest drain, it's entirely likely that those cases, which are the ones we care about, uh, the system will perform badly at. And so there's these disconnects along the way that we're taking this data from the reports, which doesn't necessarily reflect the images. Uh, these labels are somewhat unclear. They, they overlap with each other. And then we have this issue that they may or may not be medically relevant. In the case of pneumonia, um, a, a treated pneumonia is a different clinical entity than an untreated pneumonia. And, um, you know, that matters in how we interpret the results of uh, models built on this. So I would have just said that uh, as a sort of summary of what I'm saying, um, we need to have experts, uh, in this case radiologists, looking at images whenever we do an image analysis task. Um, it's very easy to get into trouble if you're building a data set or, or running a model, if you're not having the outputs checked uh, every step of the way. So yeah, that's what I think about the images. Uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, uh, the papers built on it uh, are wrong. It just means we have to be cautious about how we interpret them. Okay. Uh, Luke, could you uh, mention maybe in one or two minutes how your feedback uh, changed the versioning of this paper from the very first one that was published? Sure, sure. So uh, I have also done a, a long blog post on this paper specifically, uh, the ChexNet paper. Um, and in the process of writing that, I actually spent, I think it's several months now, talking to Pranav uh, via email. He, he was very uh, patient with me, uh, answering lots of questions. Um, one of the issues that uh, we sort of came to agree on uh, in the early version of the paper was that um, the comparison between the humans and the computer were uh, was unfair uh, to the humans. Uh, there was essentially just a, a mathematical uh, you know, peculiarity in the test that meant that when the four humans were split 50-50, uh, any one human would be given a, a score of zero instead of 50 out of 100, uh, but the system would be given a score of 50 out of 100. Um, I, I explain why that is in the blog, and uh, Paras also explained that in his blog. He's one of the other panel members today. Um, but yeah, so that was the problem, and that, uh, to their credit, they changed that immediately, uh, and we're now at version three of the paper, which has a, uh, a method which is fair to both the humans and the computer. We're going to move on to Jeremy. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, Jeremy, do you want to give a few words? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name's uh, Jeremy Howard. Um, I know some of you know me because there are a lot of uh, radiologists in our course at the moment. I'm the uh, founding researcher of um, Fast AI, uh, and uh, a lot of folks are doing the Fast AI course to learn about deep learning. Um, uh, I previously was the founder of Enlytic, which was the first organization dedicated to um, analyzing medical imaging with deep learning. Um, and uh, before that, I was uh, the president and chief scientist at Kaggle, which is the largest community of um, machine learning practitioners in the world. Um, most recently, in the last couple uh, week or so, I've uh, released um, a new state-of-the-art algorithm for natural language processing um, classification, um, which is obviously pretty relevant to some of the stuff we're talking about here. Um, so uh, Judy's asked me to talk a little bit about uh, the kind of deep learning algorithm side of things. Um, so I'll summarize the key pieces, although we've already uh, heard um, some of them. 
Uh, the starting point uh, in terms of machine learning for this uh, pipeline uh, was the NLP that uh, Luke referred to. So the uh, initial um, data set creation, uh, which started with these uh, 100,000 plus um, uh, x-rays, uh, along with radiology reports, uh, unfortunately, for obvious reasons, um, the, they were not able to release the radiology reports themselves because of um, privacy issues. So instead, what they did was they converted those reports into a list of, uh, I think it was 14 um, yes or no labels um, covering, uh, you know, so one of the yes or no labels was, for example, normal or cardiomegaly or effusion or mass or nodule or so forth. Um, the way those labels were extracted from the radiology report was with natural language processing. And specifically, they used uh, um, an old parser called BLIP um, and uh, specifically with a uh, medical specific uh, kind of parsing front end on top of that. Um, Luke mentioned that in his opinion, that first stage uh, of NLP was um, accurate enough at 90% um, uh, uh, accuracy. Um, I would uh, very much disagree with that assessment. Um, when you actually look at the paper, it turns out that uh, the vast majority of um, uh, x-rays in this data set uh, are marked as normal. Um, and so it's something like 90% if memory serves correctly. Uh, and their uh, accuracy on finding that normal, um, in terms of the NLP, uh, figuring out that a normal report actually is normal is uh, about 90%. Um, so they're not really doing better than random there. Uh, and then when you look at the specific things, for example, pneumonia, um, the precision on pneumonia is, and this is just at the NLP level, is only 60%. Uh, so when Luke said he's finding a huge difference between the images um, and uh, the labels, uh, actually a lot of this can be drawn back to the poor NLP. Um, this is not at all surprising to me as a, a NLP researcher um, working specifically on classification more recently um, because the method used in the original data set uh, for the NLP is massively out of date. It reflects a totally different generation of tools um, and uh, is known to be extremely inaccurate. So uh, I would hope that at some point someone is able to re-look at those uh, reports and uh, use a more up-to-date NLP classification system. Um, you know, looking at the folks involved in that original NAH data set release, there are no uh, deep learning or NLP researcher names that I recognize. Uh, obviously, I don't know everybody, but I think I know all the top people in the field. So I think there's been a, a bit of a problem of lack of collaboration with with the NLP and deep learning community there, um, which has caused um, a big problem. Um, so that's the first stage of the pipeline. The second stage of the pipeline then is uh, two types of pre-processing were done to the images um, by the, uh, uh, we're now moving on to the actual uh, image classification checks net past uh, part. Um, uh, the two pieces of pre-processing done was resizing them to 224 by 224 and augmenting them uh, by uh, randomly, occasionally flipping them horizontally. Um, uh, these two steps are reasonably standard, um, but uh, do leave a lot uh, on the table. Uh, there's huge opportunities to improve this model by doing those two things better. The first is that there's a lot of um, augmentations which uh, the team uh, haven't used, and we do know in the research community that effective data augmentation is one of the best things you can do to improve a deep learning model. Um, more importantly, the resizing to 224 by 224 um, is, uh, is a big mistake. Um, we know both from the research community and also from the work we did at Analytic that leaving your medical images as large as possible is a really good idea. And there's just no reason to resize to 224 by 224 um, nowadays. Um, a lot of people incorrectly think that if they are um, fine-tuning an image net model that was originally um, trained at 224 by 224 that you have to leave it at that size but that's actually not being correct for at least three years I would say um, so it's a very uh, common mistake and I do think that the team will be able to see huge improvements by rectifying those two issues um, the next stage was the choice of architecture and um, 
they chose an architecture called DenseNet, which, as discussed, uh, basically involves a number of layers which concatenate to previous layers. Um, it's an adequate choice. Uh, there are much better models nowadays, uh, and I think um, we've seen uh, with things like uh, NASNet or uh, Shake Shake based models uh, improvements of 50% or more in image classification accuracy in the last 12 months over DenseNet. Um, so I think DenseNet was a okay choice, but um, certainly lots of room to improve there. Um, next thing in the pipeline then is taking that architecture and starting with some pre-trained weights. And so the team chose to pre, uh, start with pre-trained um, image net weights. Um, a good idea, a, a pretty standard approach. Um, again, leaves a lot on the table in terms of opportunity to improve. However, um, in particular, if they could have taken some images from maybe the, the Stanford systems to do some kind of uh, semi super Supervised pre-training, uh, such as using an autoencoder uh, or um, uh, Siamese networks across patients or something like that, they certainly have a lot of room to get better results through that. Um, perhaps the most important good idea the Chexnet Net team had was to um, train on multiple labels at the same time. Uh, this is one of the most important. Um, findings in training image uh, models. In fact, really any kind of deep learning model uh, is to build a single model which um, predicts multiple things at the same time. Um, this is pretty counterintuitive to folks without a background in the field. You may think that your model would be better if it's specialized to predicting pneumonia, say, rather than predicting 14 things. But actually, it turns out that the more, um, you know, in medical imaging, for example, the more diseases you can predict at the same time, uh, the more, more kinds of features your model can detect uh, to say, like, these are what medically interesting anomalies look like. Um, so that was a very good idea, and I would say that would be the, probably the most important step they took in terms of um, getting better results than the two previous papers on this uh, data set. Um, so overall, um, this finding that uh, the, um, the model is giving a, a, about the same performance as humans, so better than um, less experienced humans and not quite as good as experienced subspecialty humans, um, is about in line with what we've seen um, both in the research we did at Analytic um, and uh, other research that I've seen. Um, you shouldn't be surprised by that. Pretty much all of the recent uh, research on convolutional neural networks in image classification have shown um, human or superhuman performance. So you should expect that any time that you analyze a medical imaging data set of a sufficient size with uh, a reasonably up-to-date um, neural network, you should see human or superhuman performance um, pretty consistently. Um, so, I mean, overall, you know, my feeling is this is a exciting piece of work. The fact that the NIH released this data set is fantastically exciting. Um, the fact that the, um, the team um, uh, created a, a, you know, reasonably competent, if slightly out of date, um, uh, model and processing approach to get some good results is very exciting. Um, I think the thing I would say, though, is expect this to get way, way better. Um, in the coming months and years, uh, as we see, you know, a better uh, uh, kind of understanding between the medical community and the deep learning community of the need to work more closely together, um, as we get more folks like uh, Luke, who actually understand both uh, radiology and deep learning, and indeed folks like uh, Judy, who's uh, running this call, who I know is taking the uh, fast AI course at the moment and becoming uh, a deep learning practitioner as well as a radiologist. Um, perhaps uh, most importantly, uh, I think the work that Luke's been talking about shows some of the things that need to be done to really take advantage of um, the opportunity to use deep learning and medical imaging. Um, one is we need much better labels. Uh, and uh, the, the tool that uh, Judy mentioned where, where folks can now online do some labeling of radiology reports is 
is a super exciting initiative and that kind of uh, actual structured labels is really, really important and currently missing. Um, perhaps most importantly is something I'd really like to see is um, pre-trained medical imaging networks to be released. Um, I think, you know, if you think about it, it's kind of crazy that the ChexNet team had to use a pre-trained image net network. The pre-trained image net network was trained on um, color photos of dogs and cats and jumbo jets and mushrooms and so forth. Uh, it has no medical images in it at all. Um, so although it's better than nothing, um, it would have been way better if the team had been able to start with any kind of medical imaging pre-trained network, uh, even if it was a pre-trained network of uh, wrist fracture x-rays or a pre-trained network of uh, uh, prostate MRIs or whatever, you know, any kind of medical imaging pre-trained network would have been better than um, ImageNet. Uh, so something that the um, medical imaging community really needs to get behind is the idea of creating some pre-trained networks for different body parts and different modalities um, and making them available to the community. I think that's actually a lot more important um, than things like the release of the uh, chest x-ray data set. Uh, releasing pre-trained networks um, would be an even uh, bigger step. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And I am going to give an opportunity to Paras, who's uh, our other panelist, to see if he has anything he would like to add or ask. Um, yeah, so I'm Paras Lakani. I'm a radiologist at Jefferson, and um, I also do um, machine learning and deep learning research. Um, not quite the experience level of, uh, you know, Dr. Jeremy Howard or, or the Stanford team, but um, I'm very excited about deep learning. And so I guess a few questions I had um, is that um, were the radiologists um, asked to label all the 14 categories in the test set? And this is kind of more of a question for like Kurt or, or Matt. Um, did they find that kind of hard to do, especially since one of the things that um, concern me is, is as a radiologist, and I read mostly chest now, is that I kind of think of infiltration, consolidation, and pneumonia in the same ballpark, and yet those were separate categories um, that, that that had to be labeled. Uh, yeah, this is Matt Lundgren. Yeah, uh, good point, uh, and I, thanks to the other panelists for the comments. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the task for the uh, radiologists, uh, they were allowed to select multiple labels, right? So if you saw infiltrates, uh, you saw consolidation, and those of us who are thoracic trained with many years experience, who are, have a better eye to determine maybe that's actually pneumonia, it would also select that label. And so the opportunity to select multiple labels um, was available to all the radiologists. Um. And then um, I think Pranav nicely summarized, you know, the updates to the paper, which are great. And that, so the other question I had was, um, he, he mentioned that there are at least 50, um, I guess, uh, pathologies or, or, or categories is a, probably a better word, uh, uh, at least 50 uh, items per, um, per each category in the test data set, right? So there's 14 different, you know, categories. So 50 times 14, so that, that's about 700. Um, and there were, I think, about 400 images or so in the test data set. So I guess just mathematically, that's about one and a half categories per image. Um, I only mention that because um, have you guys looked at other categories? Like, why was the pneumonia the only one looked at? You know, because there's pneumothorax and cardiomegaly. Um, you know, was there a trend there with the classifier doing on par with, with the human labels? Or was pneumonia really the, the interesting one that you guys just wanted to look at that exclusively? Uh, hey there, this is Pranav. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so we chose pneumonia for a, a couple of reasons. Uh, one being that um, pneumonia is something that's, that's actionable as opposed to something like, uh, um, and the radiologist can speak more on this, as opposed to something like hernia or doing some sort of radiological finding. Uh, so that's one of the reasons. The second is um, we're, we're able to sort of build models for, for all 14 labels, but a design decision we made early on, and I think these design decisions drive the, the progress and pace of the research, was we would stick to one pathology of interest 
and that pathology we chose early on to be pneumonia and something that we we stuck to in order to in order to produce this work. Um, as as uh, as Luke uh, and Faras and 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 Jeremy have mentioned that that the labels themselves are not are not great and the quality of the labels is different across the different pathologies. Uh, pneumonia happens to be one that we placed our bets on early on and uh, tried to optimize on that in order to get to uh, in order to get to expert performance. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I have I have a few I have a few uh, discussion points with 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 the others as well, but we'll we'll get to that once once we're sort of wrapped up with the session. So um, now it's eight forty seven. Normally we run this for one hour, but uh, so if anyone really needs to get off at nine p.m. Uh, please go ahead but i'm going to open the questions up to the attendees and we have some and Raym guys is one of the panelists who's on the back end and will help also answer some of the questions don't feel like you have to answer everything uh that's said because um yeah we want to go through as many questions as as we can so um one of the questions that's coming up is Christine uh, Payne asks, could we ask the model to think more like a radiologist? For example, to predict even more things at the same time, uh, like a heart border is clear, are there Cali B lines or battering pattern? Does, do you have a yeah, quick answer? That would, yeah. that, would, that would help a lot. Um, and it's actually a great way to create um, better pre-trained models is to pull out of the, you know, use NLP to pull out a lot more structured data um, from the reports. Um, so you don't just have to look for diseases, you know, or pathologies, but just look for, you know, any kind of, any kind of features at all. Uh, in fact, interestingly, even predicting things like um, age and sex uh, are useful labels. So one thing that would be a super helpful thing for the whole uh, medical and deep learning community would be if, uh, if, if somebody can create a data set where they've got lots of medical images like this um, um, uh, this NIH example, but they also pull out like everything that the radiology reports mention, because then we could create some really uh, fantastic pre-trained networks. Okay. Um, I might add something to that question if I can. Yes. Um, so I've, I've written before about how much information labels deliver to a model. And essentially what it boils down to is the, the more you uh, sort of uh, distill uh, the report down into a, a limited number of labels, the less information you're providing. And so if you had more labels, you'd be providing more information. And like Jeremy says, that is almost always better. Uh, at the base level, if you actually provide the text itself, uh, you're providing the most possible information. It, you know, it may be too much information, the system may struggle, um, but at, at a, a base level, the text itself is the raw um, expression of the radiologist, and uh, that will contain the most possible information. So if we could share reports, that would be fantastic. Uh, unfortunately, we just have this privacy issue that many ethics boards aren't happy with that. Awesome. Um, for the Judy, Stanford, Kurt. sorry. Yeah. Judy, it's Kurt Langlois, can I make a comment? Yes. Yeah, so first of all, I'm Kurt Langlotz from Stanford, and I just want to thank everyone for being here, and also special thanks to the panelists and to Dr. Oakton Rayner, who had that uh, terrific blog post that I thought was a very nice analysis and the way that open peer review really ought to work. Um, so we're happy to be here. Just a comment about labeling. We, you know, we think of labeling as incredibly important. Uh, and yes, the labels that were that came from NIH were somewhat problematic. Um, we worry about the fact that the labels had hierarchical relationships, uh, and that, in fact, when you want to create great labels, you're really facing the problem of inter-observer variability in labeling. So, uh, if we want to create a great label data set, we want to think about uh, training radiologists dealing with the gray areas, the corner cases, 
labeling in ways that we think are diagnoses that are being seen uh, and do that repetitively, um, get people in the same room, um, define the labels as, that are clinically relevant. And we think that that is uh, one of the most important drivers of building accurate models like this. So um, I know he's on mute, but I see uh, Charles Kahn as one of the attendees. And I know he leads the common data elements, so uh, which is you know, essentially a, a move towards a standardized radiology language. Would we see better performance or elimination of this uh, labeling problem if we adopted like see common data elements, or do we see structured reporting as a faster way to get replaced by the machines? I might again jump in just because I, I've written on common data elements specifically before. Um, the, the common data elements are great in the sense that they standardize what we're saying. Um, but, uh, you know, again, it's just a question of where you draw those gray zone boundaries. So in this case, the Stanford team would have made a certain decision about where pneumonia ends and something else begins. Um, the problem with standardizing language is like I said, the information contained in free text uh, is greater than when you narrow it down to, uh, to little categories. And so the, the hedge terms that we use or the, the qualifications we make when we, uh, when we describe a, a subtle uh, opacity or a, you know, a, this is likely to be pneumonia, those terms are actually meaningful uh, in an in a information sense. And uh, the system will learn more if you include those meaningful uh, qualifications than if you don't. Okay. So, uh, uh, I'm going down. yes? I was just going to respond briefly to that. I, I think that that's right. There's more information in a full text report than if we were to, you know, have uh, information from restricted pick lists. On the other hand, I think that in free text reports, if we have people using words in vastly different ways, uh, we're facing the same labeling problem we had in the NIH data set. So you, you sort of need both. You know, you'd like to have the free text, but you'd also have, like to have people using consistent language, uh, whether it's free text or as part of a structured report. I, I do think that recent advances in, in, in multimodal NLP and image models can, can deal with that. And I, I will say, uh, this is Jeremy Howard, if, if anybody listening is interested in having a go at fixing this problem, I would be more than happy to um, provide advice and show you how to deal with these things in a, in a kind of model learnt way rather than having to do it all manually. Awesome, thanks. Hey, hey, hey there, this is Pranav. Just want to quickly jump in on that. Um, I think improving the label quality is something that is incredibly important. Um, and, and, and the others on the panel have echoed that. Um, what I do think is the other lesson here, and maybe that's the lesson that's more important as a takeaway, is that we're able to use noisy labels to produce much better labels. And let's say we took ChexNet, which, has, which agrees with radiologists more than radiologists agree with each other, and we went and relabeled the data set such that rather than using the noisy NIH labels, we use the chestnut labels. Now you've got a data set that is well labeled and now can be used by other models, better models, that can make use of these labels to you know, increase the bar higher and higher. So um, our goal when we were working with this is, OK, we know we have noisy labels. And noisy labels is something in machine learning is a problem that's harder to deal with. Easy problems to deal with. Can I increase the size of my network? Can I try a different architecture? Can I try the latest and greatest architecture that's winning ImageNet in 2018 instead of 2017? Those are easy problems to answer. Harder problems to answer are, well, can I collect a new data set or can I make existing use of my data set to produce better labels? And so I think that's going to take some some long-term work and experts like uh, like like Jeremy and uh, and a lot of NLP experts to be able to get us to that level. 
Um, I think, though, that the question is, can we have labels that are noisy and still be able to do something incredibly useful with it? And that is what I hope that, that ChexNet achieves. And just to keep the, the, the goal in mind, our ultimate goal is two-thirds of the world doesn't have access to any expertise. You take a noisy label data set, you produce anything that is remotely close to a radiologist, that's already impact factor one. If you're able to do radiologist level performance, even if it's radiologist is super radiologist performance, I don't think the line between that is too big. As long as we can say we're as good as experts, in this case, we're able to show we're better than the average expert with statistical significance. But that point can be debated. So as long as we can show that we're as good as experts, I think that itself is a, uh, is, is a contribution. And so as we're moving forward, I think the question is, how can we make use of what we have to produce the best work possible? Yeah, and, and note that, and note that um, the, the, the equal to or better than human performance achieved in this ChexNest study was done with noisy labels. So although we've all talked about how we'd love to get less noisy labels, even if you can make data available with very noisy labels, we can still build uh, at least equal to human performance models with them. So, so don't feel like you, know, you can't make progress until you have great labels. We're just saying it would be better to have them less noisy, but it's certainly not necessary. Uh, definitely. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. And uh, one, one more thing I realized I, uh, I hadn't done earlier is I want to thank all of the incredible feedback that we've got from Luke, from Baras, from Jeremy on the discussion on the blogs and Twitter, because I think that if we're to make progress as a community, it's important that we're able to have these discussions and figure out best ways to move forward. And uh, it's, it's incredible that the level of professionalism that, um, you know, we've, we've strived for and we've received from the community to have conversations that really try to make our science as good as possible. And one of the comments that I see commonly about open, you know, having papers on archive is, well, there's no peer review. Well, I think the internet, the Reddit machine learning uh, thread is, proving to be a great peer review, and I think it's a great way for us to make fast progress on these uh, medical AI problems. And, uh, you know, the, I think the future holds a lot for us in terms of how we improve the quality of the labels, the quality of our models, the quality of our data, and the final step is how we deploy them out of the world. Thank you. So one thing, I know we're one minute to the hour, is I have to you know, as a Kenyan physician, actually, and I have to be, uh, to just put a word of caution, I know a lot of this AI stuff will be sold as helping developing countries. Let's be cognizant and actually get the types of studies that are performed there. We know most places, like in my hometown, they still rely on film. So let's not assume that, you know, the style of reading and everything that works here is the level of expert back, you know, in these countries that we're going in because we end up doing more harm than good. Because in such a data set without a label like tuberculosis, for me, it would never make sense, you know, and that priority would be what would change lives in developing countries. Nonetheless, I have to ask one last question for James Condon so that anyone can drop off, but we can, I'll still hang around for 30 more minutes uh, to keep discussing. Uh, does the panel think it's possible for a convoluted neural network to differentiate or separately classify opacities from each? type of from, from pneumonia, pulmonary hemorrhage, and cancerous infiltrates with, when provided with enough examples with accurate labels? I don't know about in x-rays, but I certainly know we did a lot of work um, in a, a you know, really quite difficult problem, which was classifying the malignancy of nodules uh, using the um, NLST data set, but that was using CT scans. Um, and in that case, uh, we were able to achieve uh, superhuman performance uh, at uh, classifying the malignancy of um, nodules in CT scans where the labels were the actual NLST um, follow-up labels. So I, I know it's possible in, in, in CT scans. Uh, I don't know what's possible 
um, in x-rays, however. Um, and this is Paris here. Um, one thing, you know, when you talk about the future of deep learning is there's so much untapped potential, right? Because most deep learning practitioners are, are converting these images to 8-bit and the native images are 16-bit. What that means is you're taking 65,000 shades of gray and you're, you're basically converting them to 256 shades of gray. And so I think for a really hard problem like that, like differentiating hemorrhage from like pneumonia or infiltrate, you might have to start thinking along those lines. And I think the reason why deep learning practitioners do that, it's really hard to get convergence when you have too much data. But I would defer to like Jeremy for his opinion on that, but that's just what I've noticed in Kaggle competitions um, in particular. Um, yeah, we tried looking at 16-bit images and they yeah. didn't help a lot, but using okay. larger images did help a lot. So, you know, this okay. thing of reducing it to 224 by 224 is definitely not something you want to be doing. Um, I, I'd just add to the uh, question about whether you can differentiate things. Um, I think a, a really good sort of simple way to think about these systems is that any any features that humans have been able to recognize till this point are things the systems can learn. So, for example, if you have a, a mass forming pneumonia, for example, you can probably differentiate that from a, a garden variety uh, pneumonia, and you know that's very fine grained detail. Uh, the, the system should be able to learn the same thing. Uh, the benefit of these systems is that they're so agnostic to uh, the uh, pre existing knowledge that. If there are other features we don't know about yet or are too subtle for humans to see, then they will be able to learn them. So, for example, uh, with pulmonary hemorrhage, we might expect the pulmonary hemorrhage is more dense than uh, pneumonia is. Uh, that, that's a reasonable thing to see. We, we see similar things to that on CT scans. And so if that's the case, it's entirely plausible that these systems could differentiate them. And, it, you know, it's not a, uh, a worthless task to try and do with good labels. Uh, it's just that you will need labels that clearly discriminate between the classes. Okay, so I'm going to allow the panelists to say um, a few sentences at the end of this journal club. And if you have more questions, please type them here. I'll send them to the panelists. And as usual, I'll write a blog post with all these questions and the answers. Uh, we can start with the Stanford group, because I know you're kind of in the same room. Hey, I'll just want to thank everybody for uh, for a good, good discussion and uh, for very valuable feedback throughout the process. Uh, appreciate it, and uh, thank you so much. Um, have a great evening or day, whichever side of the world you're on. <laughs> Luke? Uh, yeah, I'd uh, like to sort of second that, that um, I think uh, open peer review is a fantastic thing, and, and journal clubs like this are part of it. Um, I think, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about the paper. If people want to uh, learn more about that discussion, uh, visit my blog, visit Paras's blog, and another fellow, uh, Balint, um, who I link to on my blog, uh, to look at the issues. You know, we didn't really uh, come down as a group on, on how justified certain claims are in the paper. Um, they're discussed uh, on the blog. Uh, but by and large, I think we all uh, agree that the paper is a good paper and it is uh, very close to uh, what it uh, uh, what is suggested even in the media reports. Uh, Ray, I didn't hear much of you. Yeah, there's a couple of things. One, the the paper is excellent in, in terms of a number of things that it does. The whole discussion here that came up is around sort of the PR that came after the paper when you saw headlines about computer is better than radiologist at diagnosing pneumonia. I, what, what the computer is better at doing is extracting information from the pixel data on the image than two human eyes are. And I, I think that's just, that's absolutely true. We haven't figured out yet how to translate that ability of the machine to extract the pixel data and turn that into ways to have actionable findings, like you're talking about even for the third world. You know, I I've, I've was fortunate to be able to work in Kenya where Judy uh, trained, and 
we saw a number of patients if, with uh, HIV, and if their T4 levels are low enough, there is no inflammation, and the chest X-ray is completely normal. And we still said could be tuberculosis because of something that, you know, the image looked fine. Uh, it just needs to be an awareness of what action is going to be taken, uh, having found the information off the pixel data, if you're going to rely just on the pixel data. Awesome. Uh, Paras, do you have some last comments? Sure. First of all, I want to, to thank Judy for, for organizing this and um, the ACR. It's really incredible, the amount of work she did. Um, and um, second, also the authors for actually presenting their work. I thought they did a great job. And, um, you know, I, I did write a blog, but I actually was really impressed with um, the work that they did um, and, you know, the timeliness of the work. And um, I think that the team, the teammanship of you know the Stanford group is something that I think a lot of research groups are striving for, you know, towards, which is you know deep learning experts as well as clinicians all working together. Um, so you know, and this open peer review concept is a great one, and um, you know, but we shouldn't let it discourage people from doing good research or pursuing that. And so um, you know, it's it's just, but I think it's it's important as well. So I just kind of wanted to end with that. Awesome. Uh, I'll have Jeremy. Um, thanks very much, Judy. Yeah, I mean, so I, I think overall my, my feeling here is that this is um, this is really exciting at so many levels. The fact that this data set was released is great. The fact that this, um, this uh, analysis was done uh, was great. Uh, and the fact that we're getting human or superhuman performance, um, even despite the fact there's lots of opportunities to improve, means we're just gonna see this getting um, better and better. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but actually the reason I started Analytic was specifically for what Judy was talking about, which was to improve access to diagnostics and treatment planning in the developing world. And uh, the biggest opportunity I think here is uh, not about replacing radiologists, but actually there's a shortage of about 10x the number of doctors in the developing world that we need. Um, places like China, uh, places like India, places like Indonesia, um, there's a huge shortage. And for example, in the entire continent of Africa, outside of South Africa, there's only seven pediatric radiologists for the whole continent. So the opportunity here isn't to replace radiologists, but to give access to community health workers uh, and local doctors access to the kinds of insights that you saw in those class activation maps, those, those heat maps. You know, imagine if a, a local doctor was able to see these big red spots telling them exactly where to look. Um, that's that's where the big opportunity is, in my opinion, and so that's where I think we should be focusing on, is on providing tools using this technology uh, to help doctors and to also help uh, avoid this huge shortage of doctors worldwide. Awesome. And what Jeremy didn't say is that he has the next uh, version of his course, which is actually free and it's released online uh, coming up in February. I really learned a lot from my from the first thank round. You. So thank you. And um, so please, guys, if you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please go check out radai.club. Uh, try and look at some of these data sets and see if you can get is, um, see some of these issues that we discussed today. And um, moving forward, we are, you know, uh, considering an idea of having a group of us redo the, uh, the cost provided by Jeremy as one group. And so uh, we we'll probably end up setting up a forum so that we can uh, kind of work together, you know, not being embarrassed or afraid that you don't have any technical skills. And um, that's fine for this course. And so uh, I'm going to hang around and, you know, you don't have to feel like you have to stay, but please type your questions. I always end up emailing them to the panelists and writing a blog post. Today, I think we had very high level discussions, if you missed our last talk, uh, things can be a little bit confusing. And I hopefully, uh, with the help of Stephen Bolsterman, we will have a good blog post for you uh, to review. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, the panelists, for attending. Thank you.
me see if there are other questions here. Yeah, Ivan, yes, we'll share a recorded by oh, the last talk. Uh, I'll link it again. Let me pull it up. Hey, Paras, do you want to, uh, if you're still online, do you want to uh, talk about the data set that you've been creating for uh, oh. pneumonia? And what yeah. do you think you change from this? Sure. This, yeah. Yes. So um, at Jefferson, you know, we've, we've been creating a lot of data sets, and that's kind of been our focus for the past year um, because the deep learning techniques have been rapidly changing, but I think the data has been really important. Um, and so what we've been really interested in is more using x-rays um, as like a triaging mechanism or actually medical scans in general. Um, so what we've been doing is using um, CT as our ground truth labels and then getting the corresponding x-rays. Um, so for like pneumonia, we have a large collection of CTs that have findings that are consistent with pneumonia um, and then an x-ray that goes with it. And then we also have um, a follow-up x-ray that shows that the opacity goes away. Now, it could be hemorrhage, right? You know, so we don't know that. But we do know it's an airspace opacity that goes away, and that could be consistent with pneumonia in the appropriate context. And we have, you know, a lot of frontals and laterals. And what we find is that when you have really good data, you can throw almost any CNN at it, you know, even an AlexNet, and get, like, an AUC of 0.99, you know. Wow. Um, but, it, but it's not really that hard because it's basically normal versus abnormal. So it's not nearly as hard a problem that this Stanford group has been trying to tackle at, which is like pneumonia versus atelectasis versus fusion versus like all these mimics, right? This is just normal x-rays versus infiltrate that could be pneumonia in the appropriate clinical context. Um, so it's a, it's a simple problem. It's even a simple problem for humans, right? I think if we had humans look at this, they would get it right 100% of the time. So the point really is to flag a work list, right? So we just, because we have so many x-rays to read, our work lists are 50, 100 x-rays deep. And so we're, our goal is we just want to diagnose faster. Um, or we want the ER physicians to look at the images and they don't have to call us, you know, but all this needs to be prospectively studied, but that's sort of the idea. So we've been working on sort of that, um, that line of thinking. Awesome. Uh, I, I think that sounds uh, sort of, it's a really sensible approach that we, when we talk about labeling, um, we can talk about hard and soft labels. And so uh, sort of the, these human interpreted labels that have come from radiology reports are soft labels. They're, they're someone's opinion. It may change uh, between people. Um, in, in particular with say pneumonia in a chest x-ray, it apparently changes a great deal that, you know, uh, one one person's labels, another person might get them 50 or 60% wrong. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, going to something like CT where humans are more reliable, where they're more, uh, where there's less variability between them makes sense. Um, we've recently done a project uh, in the detection of hip fractures and uh, we used a, uh, a, what I'd call a very hard label in the sense that um, hip fractures don't get missed because uh, patients, even when they're not detected on an image, uh, eventually need surgery. And so we used whether they had surgery or not as the outcome. Um, and in that way, you probably get very close to 100% accurate labels. Uh, and in doing so, you can get uh, very high performance. Uh, and the benefit of using hard labels compared to soft labels is it makes it more plausible that you'll reach significantly superhuman performance rather than um, you know, being able to match what is a very variable level of human performance. Uh, look, could you comment about the other wrist radiograph paper? Same. same uh, yeah. yeah, I'd have to have more of a look at it to uh, be particularly informed about it. I read it a little while ago. This is the uh, Mura paper, M-U-R-A paper uh, by Stanford, I assume you're talking about. So by the same team uh, that yeah. did the checks in the paper. Um, but no, I read it a little while ago. I remember thinking that um, a lot of the issues I'd been discussing with the team over time and that the other uh, 
sort of bloggers and uh, Twitter people had raised uh, seemed to be fairly well addressed in that paper. And so um, I felt that it was a, a quite a high quality product from the get go. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I can't remember enough about the paper to speak specifically to any any issues or anything like that. Uh, the no additional questions, but look, what what other projects are you working on? I know you had a paper published recently in the Nature Journal. Uh, yeah, so uh, we've got a, a number of projects. Like uh, Paras said, a lot of it is data collection. The, uh, trying to find good, high, high quality data sets is uh, a major uh, component of project time that it probably takes at least 80% of the time of doing any of these projects is just collecting the data in the first place. Um, the, the projects we've published so far are a couple of things. Um, one, we have a, uh, a model that can look at chess CTs and try and predict how long people are going to live. Um, this is a, unlike the things we've been talking about, this is something radiologists don't do. So it's it's kind of exploring new boundaries in, in how much information we can extract from images. Uh, and you know, the idea is that it will just assess sort of the tissue health in some way. It will detect features like coronary artery disease and emphysema and things like that. And kind of trying to generate a, a biological age of a person. Um, like I said, we've done this uh, hip fracture project where we got you know, really, uh, I, I think, outstanding results. We're, we're currently testing that against humans and. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a, a paper out on that very soon. Um, we've also explored some natural language processing stuff, like uh, Jeremy was talking about. Mm -hmm. So we have a we have a system that um, essentially acts uh, as a teacher for radiology trainees. Um, it it re replicates the experience of having a consultant watch over your shoulder, um, and so the way it does that is uh, you get a a study, uh, you report it in, in text, and the system will compare that to a pre-existing consultant report and tell you which of your statements is right and which is wrong. So uh, you know, in this case, uh, if you say there's pneumonia present, it'll say, uh, you know, the consultant didn't say that. The consultant said uh, that there is a mass lesion, for example. On the same study or a different study? On the same study. So we, we use as, uh, as a teaching set for the trainees, we use studies that have been reported by consultants. And so uh, we compare whatever the trainee says to the pre-existing consultant report. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Uh, Rain, do you have any additional stuff to say? No, I think this just brings up a variety of uh, things about how you know, it's it's relatively easy to write an algorithm uh, to do something with your data, but understanding the data and making it turn out correctly turns out to be, you know, it's just more difficult than it may look at first glance. Um, so I wouldn't want, I, I hope this both excites, well, I hope it doesn't discourage anybody, but it makes you realize that it's it's not uh, child's play either. Trying to figure out the data, it, the, the data seem to always, and the data structures always cause the problems and take the time when you're dealing with one of these things. I, if I could just jump in for a second, uh, I think that's totally right, and um, also what Paras mentioned before that. Um, we have a problem at both ends at the moment with uh, the non-algorithm part of the problem. That we have a problem with data at the front end, and we have a problem with clinical implementation at the back end. Um, you know, the even if we have a system that is clearly superhuman uh, at a certain task, in this case, say pneumonia detection, how do we actually apply that in the clinical setting? You know, it can't replace radiologists reading the study because there could be more things than pneumonia on the study. Um, does it give them a recommendation that pneumonia is present or not? And if so, how often will they take that recommendation? How safe is it to do that? Um, does it simply replace them for that one task and uh, provide a little line at the bottom and we don't have to care about pneumonia anymore? We don't know if that works. Um, so 
uh, the, the one sort of concept I really like in this space is that um, when we do medical trials, we talk about phase one, two, and three medical trials. And we have to remember that every single radiology study done so far, including all of the ones that are human or superhuman, uh, and, or, or medical AI trials, they're all phase two. And phase two trials uh, in the medical space are still at least five years away from implementation uh, in getting into clinics. And they have something between a 10 and 30% chance of ever getting to clinics at all. So uh, we have uh, this situation where we're not far enough along yet to know exactly how we're going to be using these systems. Interesting. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I, implementation and operational AI, I mean, that's a topic unto itself. You've got the scalability and security issues and integrating with the existing infrastructure and how are you going to govern them and da 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 da. You mentioned the stage one, two, and three. The ACR is, uh, that's really where the ACR has decided to focus in this entire AI space is in the uh, validation and verification of these algorithms on it that are going to be used operationally. Uh, again, that's a, it's just a big complicated topic I don't know if there are any papers on it. We'd be happy to have a session on that at some point, uh, if you wish, Judy. Yeah, so uh, we're hoping to have definitely more ideas of what people want to hear. I think one of the feedbacks for today was that the content was pretty technical <laughs> and uh, miscare of some of the people who are getting started in this space, but hopefully, um, you know, normally uh, we write, the last time I wrote a, a blog post where I describe most of the things. And so uh, hopefully that's going to help uh, people kind of get to understand. So there's a question for you, Luke, one uh, from Brian. Uh, one of the points you imply in several of your blog posts is that radiologists use of language is inconsistent and problematic. You see a role for AI in helping resident training. You kind of answered part of that, but. I don't know if you have something to say. Yeah, I mean, I think we have this uh, tension, as we've sort of said a couple of times so far, that um, we want uh, sort of, we want our data sets to be reasonably easy to manage. And to do that, we'd like standardization of language. Um, but we also want our data sets to contain a huge amount of information. And for that, we want free text. Um, it's unclear to me exactly where that balance lies. I kind of suspect with the pace that deep learning is improving at the moment, we probably should lean towards working out how to deal with the messy data rather than uh, putting effort into changing human practice. Uh, you know, I think people have been talking about standardized reports for many decades now, and the uptake has been poor. <laughs> um, you know, people don't like changing how they practice. And uh, you know, there's as many opinions on this as there are radiologists. So uh, I kind of feel it may not be useful to force people, either with AI or not, to uh, be more standardised. And it may uh, not be possible. It may be a, a, a failing task to, to try and force them down that path. I suspect our models will get good enough that we can just deal with the mess. And uh, there's a question for you from Isaac. Do you have any information about the accuracy of the bounding box annotated subset of the NIH? Oh, yeah. No, I saw that pop up. Um, no, I don't. So I would assume, uh, I haven't looked into that. Uh, uh, you know, that I spent quite a lot of time just looking at the labels themselves. So uh, I, I didn't feel like jumping straight into that. I assume they're much better because you don't put a bounding box around something that's not there. Um, but uh, no, I haven't uh, explored that. Okay, any last burning question for the evening? Okay, thank you so much for coming to the AI Journal Club. I hope you come to the next one. It's gonna be amazing too, because Timnit is great. I think uh, it's going to be a very big eye opener. Thank you everyone. Thanks very much. Great, okay. yeah, thanks. Bye. Thanks, Jim.